It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. First thing we should do is kill all the lawyers. Anybody know where that's from? Other than your own personal thoughts, you know, anybody know where that's from? Nobody? Shakespeare, all right. Thank you, our school teacher back there in the back. Or you were Googling one of the two, I'm not sure. But uh, that's a line from Henry VI. Uh, one of the characters says the first thing we should do is kill all the lawyers. We, we have this kind of love-hate relationship with lawyers and courtroom and all that kind of stuff. So on one hand, we love to tell jokes like, what do you call 5,000 lawyers in the bottom of the ocean? A good start, that's right, yeah. Uh, so we love these kind of jokes, but on the other hand, we love courtroom dramas. We love legal thrillers and books and movies and TVs, and, and it's, I mean, it's nothing new. Think about how many, you know, law and order kind of shows you can think of that are on the TV today. We, we love these things, and they go all the way back to, you know, Perry Mason back in the 50s. You know, remember Perry Mason? Come on, Homer, I'm sure that was your generation back there. Uh, so we love all these things, right? Homer's always picking on me, so I'm just trying to pick on him back, you know. <laughs> Uh, so we love all these things, but, and they go all the way back, not just to Perry Mason, and not just back to uh, Shakespeare, they really go back to the time of Christ. It's really interesting in, uh, so the gospel writer Luke, Luke writes a two-volume series. He writes the gospel of Luke, which is the story of the life of Christ, and he writes the book of Acts, which is the story of the spread of the gospel to the furthermost parts of the earth. Both of those, he spends extensive time with kind of legal drama, courtroom drama. So in the Gospel of Luke, he tells us of the legal drama surrounding the trials of Jesus. So Jesus goes through five trials. He's arrested in the garden. He appears before the high priest, and then before the Sanhedrin, then before Pilate, then before Herod, and then before Pilate. And it takes him 50 verses to tell the, the legal drama of Jesus. Then you get to the book of Acts, and Luke describes in great detail the legal drama of the Apostle Paul. Paul's arrested in Jerusalem in chapter 21. And he goes through five trials as well. He goes through a trial with the tribune that we'll see, and then another trial before the tribune, and then before the governor Felix, and then the governor Festus, and then before King Herod Agrippa. Five trials. The Gospel of Luke tells us in 50 verses, the trials of Jesus, it takes 165 verses in Acts to tell us the legal drama of Paul. Six chapters of the book of Acts is given to the legal drama of Paul. 21% of the book. Now, why in the world does Luke spend so much time over the legal drama of the Apostle Paul? Well, scholars offer this reason, and I think there's some truth to this. One of the things that Luke is trying to do here is to demonstrate to the Roman government that Christianity should be accepted as a legal religion in Rome. So Rome had modified religious liberty. As long as your religion was on the list, then you had religious freedom. Judaism, of course, was on the list, but this new thing, Christianity, after the resurrection of Jesus, wasn't on the list. And so Luke here makes this case that Christianity is no threat to Rome. In fact, at the end of all these trials, King Herod says to Paul, this man has done nothing worthy of being in prison and nothing worthy of being put to death. The Christianity is no threat to the Roman Empire. So maybe that's why Luke is doing this. But what we're going to see today, more importantly, is in one of these trials, it appears that Paul is on trial for the gospel, but what actually we time, find out is that Felix is the one who's on trial. The gospel has this ability to turn everything upside down, and we see the gospel is relevant even in the courtroom. So Acts chapter 24, if you want to read the same translation I'm reading, it's in the bulletin there. Uh, let me just summarize some of this, and we'll read some of this. So in Acts 24, this is the third trial. This is the trial before the governor uh, in Caesarea, so Paul was in the temple in Jerusalem. Of course, he's been preaching Jesus is the Messiah. Many Jews do not believe that. So a mob starts. They drag him out of the temple. They're basically going to beat him to death. The soldiers intervene to save his life. They put him in protective custody. The tribune, which is basically the highest-ranking military officer, holds court trying to figure out what's going on. He can't figure out. Second day, he holds another court. He invites the Sanhedrin to come down and make the official charge against Paul. What's this guy really doing? Still can't figure it out. So he refers it to the governor of Caesarea, a guy by the name of Felix. And this is where we are in chapter 24. Now, who is Felix? Well, what we know from history about Felix is that Felix was a very corrupt governor. The one thing that's labeled on him through all of his life is he, he accepted bribes. He accepted graft and corruption. He abused his power. Um, and so we know that about Felix. We're also going to meet his wife, a lady by the name of Drusilla. 
We find out about Drusilla as she's from a Jewish background. But also, Drusilla was very, uh, very attractive, historians tell us. And so she kept catching the eyes of different kings. And she was married to the king of Syria. And Felix fell for her and so enticed her to leave her husband and come marry him. And so uh, to abandon her husband and come marry him. So this is Felix and Drusilla, right? Great couple. Uh, corrupt power, rule and morality on the side. This is who Paul appears before. So uh, Tertullus is the lawyer for the Sanhedrin. He shows up before Felix and is going to make the charge against Paul. Why should Paul be put to death? Three charges. One, he stirs up riots. Two, he's a leader of this re illegal religious group, this sect called the Way. And number three, he was profaning the temple. That's the charge that he makes. And then in verse 11 of chapter 24, Paul begins his defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disrupting uh, with anyone or stirring up a crowd, excuse me, disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. So Paul is saying, the way is not a new religion. This is the fulfillment of Judaism. I believe what the law and the prophets are pointing to the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Having a hope in God, verse 15, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Key phrase. There will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. He continues in his defense to basically say, when I was in the temple, I wasn't causing problems. I was, I was giving an offering. But really, the reason I'm on trial before you here today, and he repeats it in verse 21, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. He believes in the resurrection. He believes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which proves that he's the Messiah, and he believes that there is a resurrection of the just and the unjust, that all people will be raised. That's why he's on trial. So Felix, verse 22, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, when the Lysias, the tribune, comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. Well, we find out later what he's really hoping is he's going to get a bribe. Just, Paul, if you could slip me a little cash, this whole thing would go away. That's really what he's hoping. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. Now, why is Luke giving all this legal drama stuff, all this courtroom stuff? How is this kind of edifying to the soul at all? Here we get to the point. How do you share the gospel with the person who holds the keys to your jail cell? How do you present the gospel to the person who holds the keys to your jail cell? He can unlock the cell and set you free. How are you going to share the gospel to that person? I mean, I can think of some good ways to do it. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Right? Felix, you should give your life to Jesus because he'll make your life great. It could be your best life now. Uh, all your problems will be solved. He'll help you become prosperous and more powerful than are. You should you know, give your life to I mean, On and on. You could think of ways to share the gospel in that scenario. Big shocker, that's not how Paul shares the gospel. I find it fascinating how he, how he reduces the gospel to these four ideas that are just so incredible. So as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. In desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Luke just says Felix was succeeded. What actually happened is the emperor, who was Nero, recalled Felix from his position because he was so corrupt. Nero, no paragon of virtue in himself, you know, so when you're too corrupt for Nero, you're way off the deep end, right? So that's why he was recalled. So look how, how the Apostle Paul just boils the gospel down to the essentials with these four concepts. I put them in your bulletin just so you can see them very clearly. The first thing he says to, to Felix is, there is a resurrection of the just and the unjust. Now think about this. He's talking to Felix, who is the governor of Caesarea, incredibly powerful man, and, and saying to, to Felix, you know, Felix, right now, everything's looking good in your life. 
I mean, you have all of this power, you have all of this luxury, everything looks great for you right now, but this life is coming to an end. Everyone dies. Everyone before you sell this position has died. You're going to die. Everyone dies. And death is not the end. There is a resurrection of the dead, a resurrection of everyone. Now, just chew on that idea for a little bit. If, if your life extends beyond the 70, 80, 100 years, whatever God gives you to walk this earth, if your life extends beyond that, how important is it what happens to you after this life is over? It's pretty important. Because if there is an eternity after this life, the 100 years of this life is not going to mean anything compared to the eternity that follows. So it begins with this idea that, Felix, there is a resurrection. After this life is over, you will not just die and be gone, but there is a resurrection. But what happens after, I mean, what happens at the resurrection? That's the first, second idea he shares. There is a judgment to come. At the resurrection, there is a judgment. Now think about that idea for a little bit. To say that there is a judgment, number one, says that there is a, an authority over you, greater than you, that will determine something about your life. So here's Felix, who, I mean, really, he's the most powerful person in his little world. I mean, the emperor obviously was above him, but he's pretty high on the food chain. And here's Paul saying to him, I know you think you're really high up, but there will come a time when you will stand in judgment, and there will be authority over you that will make a judgment. And this judgment will determine what happens in the life in the future, right? So the determination becomes very simple. Then what's that judgment based on? What's the criteria of the judgment? So we, uh, we just took uh, my, my son to college on Monday. So my daughter's senior in high school. So we're really in that uh, admission to college. How do you qualify for scholarship kind of conversation all the time? So this idea of criteria is very alive for us. So, so what criteria do you have to get into that college? What are they looking for? This scholarship, what's the criteria? Is it a test score? Is it, you know, what are they looking for? So we know a lot about criteria in that area. If you've ever applied for a mortgage loan because you want to buy a house, the bank is going to set a criteria. And so your question is, what's the criteria of the bank? Is it debt-to-income ratio? Is it how much money I make? What's the criteria? If you ever applied for a job, that's what you're looking at. What's the criteria? Is there a, do I need a certain degree? Do I need a certain amount of years in this job? What's the criteria? There's going to be a judgment made whether or not I give you the job. So what's the criteria? So when Paul says to Felix, look, Felix, there is a resurrection of the just and the unjust. There is a judgment that is to come. The idea that there is a criteria and what's the criteria is the obvious question. So what's the third thing that Paul talks about? Talks about the resurrection of the just and the unjust, says there is a judgment to come, and the third thing he talks about is righteousness. Righteousness. Now, why does Paul talk about righteousness? Well, one reason, because it goes to, at judgment day, what is the standard of judgment? What is the criteria? So Paul's talking to Felix and says, look, when this life is over, Felix, there is a resurrection, there's a judgment to come. And there's going to be someone making a determination about your eternity. And it's not going to be based upon how much power you had in this life. It's not going to be based upon your lineage. It's not going to be based upon how much favor the emperor gives you. It's not going to be based upon how much power you have, how much money you have. It's not going to be based on any of that. What it's going to be based upon is the righteousness of God. And if you fall short of that standard, the righteousness of God, then your eternity goes one direction. If you can meet the righteous standard of God, then your eternity goes another direction. Now, guess what, Felix? Everyone falls short of the righteousness of God. Some of us, more than others, we would say that jokingly, but compared to the righteousness of God, the difference between me and Felix is really negligible, right? We all fall short of the righteousness of God. And as Paul was talking about righteousness... As he started by talking about the righteous standard of the judgment, I have no doubt that Paul began to talk about the righteousness of Christ. Because when he talked about the righteousness in other scriptures, this is what he talked about. So I put this paragraph in your notes from Romans 3. 
I mean, when Paul talks about righteousness, these are all the ideas that he talks about. So Romans 3, verse 20, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. What Paul's saying there is no one that can, can be righteous in God's sight because we all fall short. Verse 21, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, but the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. So when Paul talks about righteousness, he always talks about this is the righteous standard of God. None of us get even close to it. But the good news about Jesus is that God has done something for us so that we can meet the righteous standard of God. And I'm sure Paul at this point began to talk about Jesus and how Jesus died on the cross for our sins and for Felix's sins and took all of his sins on the cross and died in his place. And there's this great exchange that takes place where our sins are laid upon Jesus and Jesus' righteousness is laid upon us. And therefore, on Judgment Day, we meet the righteousness of God, not from our own righteousness, but because Christ's righteousness has applied to us. I am sure Paul began to talk about this with Felix just over and over and over, which brings us to the fourth thing that he talked about. He said, Felix, there is a resurrection of the just and the unjust, and when that resurrection comes, there's a judgment. There will be one over you who will make a determination about your eternity. And you will either spend eternity with God or you will spend eternity separated from God. You'll spend eternity in a place scriptures call heaven. You'll spend eternity in a place separated from God in a place that scriptures call hell. And that determination will be made by the judge. But what's the standard? The standard is the righteousness of God. But we all fall short of that. But the good news is that Christ has done something on our behalf so that we can meet the righteousness, righteous standard of God. At what point, Felix is probably saying, well, I went in on that. Yeah, check me off on that box. You know, I, I, what, what do I got to do just to make sure that on the, that judgment day I'm headed to the right, right side? What's the fourth thing that Paul brings up? Self-control. Self-control. Not exactly talking to two people who have the uh, reputation of self-control. You're talking about two people who have the reputation of the exact opposite of self-control. So think about it. When I say to you, you need to exercise some more self-control. What I'm saying to you is there's something inside you that needs to be controlled, right? If, if you were doing everything great, I wouldn't say to you, you need to exercise self-control. I only say that to you if there's something that you're doing that I want you to control. So when I say to you, you need to exercise self-control, I'm saying there's something inside of you that needs to be controlled. It's another way of saying there is a sin nature inside of you that has to be controlled. So when, when Paul would talk about self-control, I am sure that because in Galatians chapter 5, he lists self-control as the fruit of the Spirit. Both of these ideas, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Well, how do we do that? We do that by we walk by the Spirit, and that's how we do not gratify the desires of the flesh. So as Felix is saying, well, well Paul, I, sign me up for that eternal life thing. Where do I sign? Paul comes back and says, well, you need to realize that in order to have faith in Jesus Christ, it means that you confess that you are a sinner and you repent. And repent is I turn away from my sin and I give you the lordship of my life. And what happens in that is you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and through the gift of the Holy Spirit, you will become sanctified into the image of Christ as you walk away from your sinful desires. And then interesting how just the four concepts, he just lays them out. There is a resurrection of the just and unjust. There will be a judgment day. There's a criteria of righteousness. Christ is how we meet that criteria. And when that happens, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit to put to death our sin nature and to have self-control. But what's Felix's reaction to the gospel? The ESV says he was alarmed. The word there literally means terrified. What do you think terrified Felix as he heard there's a resurrection, there's a judgment, righteousness, self-control? What, what terrified Felix? 
Was he terrified because he got a picture of Judgment Day and he knew that uh, if Judgment Day were to come today, he would be spend eternity in this place called hell? Is that what terrified him? Or was he terrified by the idea that if I put my faith in Jesus, I'm no longer going to be in charge of my life. Jesus Christ will be in charge of my life, and he's going to lead me a different direction, and I don't want to go that way. I don't know what terrified Felix. But his reaction was, he said, go away, and when I get an opportunity, I will summon you. Or the NIV says, when it's convenient to me, I'll call you back. How many people have said that to the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know, I, I'm young, I'm just having a good time, my life's just getting started, I've got plenty of time to talk and think about that Jesus thing. When I've lived and I've had a good time and, and I've come to the end of all that and you know, I'm near death, you know, like I'm 40, something like that, then, then I'll get serious about the Jesus thing. But right now I just kind of want to live. There is a huge risk of saying, go away from me, Jesus, when it's more convenient, I'll talk to you about it. Number one, you are not guaranteed to have another opportunity to hear the gospel. Here Felix has two years where he's yanking Paul's chain back and forth, really trying to get a bribe out of him. Paul's preaching as best he can. Then Nero yanks him back to Rome. We don't know what happens to him in Rome. But we don't ever know that he ever hears the gospel again. So you, you may be sitting here today and, and hearing the way that Paul presented the gospel to Felix and it suddenly makes sense to you, this idea that there's a resurrection, there's a judgment, there is a standard, you fall short, Jesus meets that standard, and to give your life to Jesus means that you have him into your life and now it's putting to death your sin nature and sanctification and turning away from sin and turning to Jesus and, and suddenly you're seeing that in a way that makes sense to you, the way that Paul said it to Felix, and you're, you're wanting to say, I, I'll take care of that later, I'll do that later. I just say to you, you're not guaranteed a later. You're not guaranteed that there's going to be an opportunity that you're going to hear the gospel again. But the second thing is even worse. Every time that you say no to the gospel, you have to harden your heart a little bit to say no. And the next time you hear it, you've got to harden it a little bit more. And the next time you hear it, you harden it a little bit more. And what happens is you keep hardening your heart, hardening your heart, and you get down to, you know, you're 40 and near death and think, okay, now it's time to get, you know, serious about faith. But your heart is so hard you don't hear. That's a huge risk to take. Some of you here today, the Holy Spirit has been gracious to you today to hear the gospel as Paul has presented it to Felix and to call you to saving faith today and say, stop saying, go away from me, Jesus. I'll take care of that when I get an opportunity but it's time to say yes to Jesus. Well, what does any of this have to do with the Lord's Supper? At this time, I invite our deacons down to get ready to serve the Supper. And you're looking at this and think, what, you know, what in the world does a legal courtroom battle have to do with anything with the Lord's Supper? And I, as they're walking down, if I can continue to have your attention, please. Remember what this represents. All of this represents... The cup represents the blood of Jesus. The bread represents the body of Jesus. All of this points to the cross. The body of Jesus that was broken, the blood of Jesus that was poured out. Why was Jesus on the cross? The reason Jesus was on the cross was to bear your sins so that your sins can be laid upon him and so that his righteousness can be laid upon you. You know why all this happened? is so that Judgment Day can be good news for you. I mean, you got to think about it on Judgment Day. If you get this picture, Jesus comes back, and he comes back with all of his angels. He comes back in his resurrected glory, and you're standing on Judgment Day in front of this, this resurrected, glorified, second eternal person of God. Do you think on Judgment Day you're going to stand there and say, yeah, I kind of deserve to get into heaven? Or do you think that your overwhelmingness of how short you fall from his glory is going to wash all over you. And then at that moment, this becomes good news. Because I do not stand before the resurrected Christ on judgment day dressed in my righteousness. I stand on judgment day dressed in the righteousness of Christ. Which means Christ will look at me and say, my child, 
the one whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life, the one who is redeemed. Welcome to the place that I have prepared for you. The glory of this. This is why we celebrate this. So in a moment, uh, we're going to stand. Uh, we're, in a moment, we're all standing together. The band's going to come and we're going to sing. And when you're ready, we invite you to come down to uh, the supper. If you can confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to participate. If you can't make that confession, just, just stay in your seat and sing. That's fine. But when you come down, this is what I want to invite you to do. One of the deacons will be holding a tray that has the cup. And as you approach that cup, would you, would you meditate on this idea? All of your sinfulness was laid upon Jesus. Every single aspect of your heart, mind, soul, behavior, everything about you that falls short of the glory of God was laid upon Jesus at the cross. Not 75%. Not 80%, not 95%, all of it. And when you come and you drink that cup, I just invite you to take a moment there before you drink that and say, thank you, Jesus, for taking all of my sins on Calvary. Then you will go to the deacon that has the tray with the bread, and I invite you to take that piece of bread and return back to your seat. And before you eat that, I want you to, I want to challenge you to meditate on the idea that all of his righteousness was laid upon you. I want you to be washed by the idea the righteousness of Christ has been applied to you. When you stand on the throne of judgment day, what God the Father is going to see is the righteousness of Christ. I want that to wash over you. And when you have worshiped and given thanks to God and celebrated that, then you eat that bread as a testimony uh, to that. So would you join me in a spirit of prayer as we bow our heads and get ready, ready for this?